Good day, students. Uh, welcome to part five of the AP Calculus AB uh, Multiple Choice Rules Questions for 1998. In this installment, we're going to be going over questions 21 through 25. All right, so let's take a look at question number 21. So we're told that if dy dt is equal to ky and k is a non zero constant, then y could be. Uh, which of the following could y be? So uh, question 21 is a differential equation uh, problem. So y dt equals ky. And the method that we can use to solve this elementary differential equation is the method of separation of variables. Okay, remember that k is a constant. So the only variables we have here are y and t. Okay, so how about we place the y's on the left side and the t's on the, on the right side, okay? So if I multiply both sides by dt and divide by y, I'm going to have um, uh, dy over y equals kdt. Okay? All right, so let's um, rewrite this piece. I can write it as 1 over y dy is equal to kdt. Now, to solve this differential equation, I've already separated the variables. I can just physically integrate both sides and to find my answer, all right? To find equation, all right? So I'm going to uh, find the antiderivative of 1 over y dy equals, now since k is a constant, I can factor out k out of the integral, or the integral of dt, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and... Uh, find the antiderivative of 1 over y, it's going to be the natural logarithm of the absolute value of y. And then if you imagine that there's a 1 here, or just a constant, or uh, 1 times t to the 0. If I integrate that, it's going to simply be kt, plus some constant, let's call it c1, okay? All right, so let's try and isolate y, so that will be the equation, the differential equation that satisfies the initial condition. And we'll basically see which of this matches uh, the form that we have as our result, okay? All right, so the uh, inverse operation of natural logarithm is exponent. So we're gonna exponentiate both sides using E as our basis. So we have um, E to the ln of Y is equal to E to the KT plus the constant C1, okay? Um, so this E and the ln cancel out. So we have the absolute value of Y equals e to the kt plus, I'm writing my t properly, plus c1. We know that um, the exponential function is always positive, so we can drop the absolute value. So we have y equals, now using the product property of exponents, we can break this down into e to the kt times e to the um, c1, okay? Now, e to the c1 is going to be a constant. Let's call that constant c. So let um, e to the c1 be some constant c. Okay? So we're going to have y become uh, c times e to the kt. All right? So c is basically some constant. All right? So this is the uh, differential equation that the, the equation that satisfies this differential equation that we have right here. This is a solution. So let's see which of these answers are in this form. If you take a look at option one, you have kty, but we don't have any y as a variable here, as a variable in the exponent, so option A is not an answer. How about option B, 2e to the kt? That works perfectly, because if c is equal to 2, because we know c is a constant, then a formulation of this solution will be 2e to the kt, which matches option B exactly. So our answer to this differential equation is letter B. All right? Okay. All right, so for question 22, we're, at, we're given a function. So it says um, the function f is given by fx equals x to the 4 plus x squared minus 2, on which of the following intervals is f increasing. So what's the connection between um, f, uh, what, what uh, tool in calculus can tell us when f is increasing? Remember, it is the first derivative that can be used to tell when f is increasing. If we're talking about concavity, then we use the second derivative, all right? So remember that um, if f is increasing, that basically means the slope of the tangent line is going to be upward. So if f is increasing, then 
the derivative f prime is going to be positive. Okay? And then if f is decreasing, well, it, it goes both directions, you know. If a function is decreasing, then f prime is going to be negative. Or if f prime is negative, the function will be decreasing. It goes both directions, okay? All right, so uh, basically, this holds um, uh, if and only if the, I mean, this is a condition if f is a uh, continuous and differentiable, okay? So this can this uh, statement is true, basically, if f um, is continuous and differentiable, okay, um, on the domain d. So if you look at this function, obviously, the function it has a continuous function and um, it's differentiable. All right, so that's the connection we're going to be using here. So the one that we need is uh, the first one, except about increasing. So if when f is increasing on a continuous and differentiable function, the first derivative is positive. So uh, all we just have to do is find the first derivative and then see where it's positive and on that interval that's where uh, the function is increasing okay so how do we find the first derivative well we'll write down the function f of x equals x to the power plus x squared minus 2 find the derivative f prime of x is uh, 4x to the third plus 2x um, let's uh, factor this so f prime of x will be equal to for, uh, 2x, let's factor out 2, um, factor out 2x, times 2x squared uh, plus 1, okay? All right, so um, we can create a number line, set both factors equal to 0, Basically, that tells us where f is neither increasing nor decreasing. So if you set the first factor to 0, 2x equals 0, and you solve, um, you're going to end up with a real number x equals 0. So let's graph that, x equals 0. Uh, and then if you look at this expression right here, we're not, uh, it's, we don't have any value that makes this uh, equal to zero okay it's always it's always positive so uh, only unreal values will make this um will make this zero okay but we're focusing on just real numbers so forget about solving this uh, we just focus on 2x okay let me just show you on the side here if i wanted to solve this 2x squared plus one i'll have x squared equals negative one half and i'm going to have imaginary numbers if i try to solve this because i'm going to root these two and then i'm going to have um negative uh, roots 2 over 2, negative roots 2 over, I mean, i roots 2 over 2 here, which is imaginary, so we just forget about this, okay? This is always going to be positive regardless. It never gets to 0, all right? So uh, this is the only one we're going to be looking at. This is the only uh, critical point we're going to be considering here. So um, let's pick a number in interval 1 and interval 2, plug it into f prime, and see where... Um, f prime is positive. Wherever f prime is positive, um, that's where the function is going to be um, increasing. Okay? Alright, so let's test uh, interval 1. We're going to use x equals 1 number to the left of 0. How about negative 1? x equals negative 1. Let's try that. Um, we're going to test it in, in the function. Um, f prime of x equals 2x times 2x squared plus 1. Plug it in here, f prime of negative 1 is going to be 2 times negative 1. Now this piece doesn't really care, so I can just drop it because it's always going to be positive. If I work this out, I'm going to end up with negative 2. So all I care about is a sign. Since it's negative, negative, that tells me that the function is going to be decreasing from, zero, from negative infinity all the way to 0. Okay? So in this open interval all the way here, the function is going to be decreasing because the first derivative is negative. All right, let's test the second interval, interval 2, where x is, let's use a, how about use positive 1 as a test uh, number, okay, because it satisfies this inequality right here for any value 
of x does bigger than 0. So x equals 1, we plug it in, we have f prime of 1. Remember, this piece is always positive, so forget about it. 2 times 1 is 2, which is a positive number. So it's positive, so that means that the function is basically increasing on this interval right here. So from uh, to the right, so any number bigger than 0, the function is going to be increasing. Okay, So we have increasing over here. So uh, what does this tell, tell us? It tells us that um, f of x is increasing uh, for x greater than 0. How do we write this in uh, um, interval notation? Uh, you can write from 0 all the way to infinity like that. Okay? So our answer for 22 is option letter C. All right. All right, let's take a look at question number 23. We have a function sketched there, and we are asked to uh, sketch the graph of the uh, first derivative, uh, which is, this is the graph of f is shown, which of the following could be the graph of the derivative of f, which is f prime. So don't let the look of the graph confuse you. Um, you just want to focus on, on the relationship between f and f prime, okay? So let me, I'm just going to sketch attempt to sketch the graph here and then we'll see if we can generate the graph of f prime by using that information all right so something like this all right so um one uh, way you can uh do this is to think about your trig functions this looks like a cosine function right centered around here and if you think about the cosine function, what's the derivative of the cosine function? It's negative sine, right? Negative sine. So what, which of these functions look like a negative sine function centered around here, around this point? You can clearly see that the answer is option um, letter A. So just by using uh, the nature of trig curves and the derivatives, we can automatically see that the answer is going to be option A. All right, let's assume we don't want to use that trick. Let's do it the long way. So if I take a look at this function, I know the connection between f and f prime is that when f is increasing, then I know for a certainty that um, f prime is going to be positive. And then when f is uh, decreasing, then I know that uh, f prime is going to be negative. And now I know if f is at a max, or a min, I know that uh, I know that uh, f prime is is going to be zero. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this graph from a to this value right here to this maximum value. The function is increasing, right? The function is, is going up. So the function is increasing on this interval. So what does that tell me? It tells me that f prime on this interval f prime is going to be what? Positive. Okay? f prime will be positive. So it's going to be above the x-axis. And then at this point right here, what does it tell me? It's, you have a max here. So at this point, f prime, guess what? It's going to be equal to 0. And then here the function is actually decreasing. So the function is decreasing on this interval from this maximum point to b then f prime is going to be negative on this interval okay so looking for any answer here that's the function is above the x-axis on the left side as it intersects the x-axis at this max value and then it goes down here okay so which of these are, uh, fit that value i mean that description option a fits it perfectly because for option a we see that uh when you to the left of the max your function is above the x-axis, it looks something like this. And then when you get to the max, it hits, it gets to zero because uh, the, the derivative has to be zero when f is at a maximum mean. And then when the function is decreasing, f prime has to be negative and in option A, the function is going, is, be, is below the x-axis, which indicates negativity. All right, so we can clearly see that the answer is option letter A. Okay, so two uh, different ways of, of figuring it, that out. All right, let's take a look at question number 24. Uh, it says the maximum speed uh, acceleration attained on an interval from 0 to 3 
by a particle whose velocity is given by v of t equals t to the third minus 3t squared plus 12t plus 4 is. So we are um, optimizing or maximizing the acceleration function in this problem. So first thing we have to do is let's get the function where we're trying to maximize here, which is the acceleration function. The relationship between acceleration and velocity is that the acceleration is an instantaneous rate of change of the velocity. So we just differentiate the velocity function to get the um, acceleration function. So a of t, um, a of t is basically uh, 3t squared minus 6t plus 12 okay so when is this at its maximum so what we're going to do is we're going to test we are going to test the critical values and the x the boundary points okay so we're going to test 0 3 and the critical values the critical values are where the um, rate of change of acceleration is 0 okay so to get that um, we're basically going to um, differentiate the acceleration again and set it to 0 okay so let's differentiate the acceleration a prime of t is equal to 6t minus 6. All right, so set that to 0. Basically, this is to help me find an extreme value um, of, 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 um, of t, okay? So set this to 0 and solve, and then we're going to get t equals negative 6, positive 6 over 6, which is just 1. So we're going to be testing. We're going to test the our boundary points, t equals 0, and then we're also going to test t equals 3, and then we're going to test the uh, critical point t is equal to 1 where the acceleration, I mean where the uh, derivative of the acceleration was 0, okay? So when t is equal to 0, what is the value of the acceleration here? So a of 0 is basically 3 times 0 squared minus 6 times 0 plus 12. These two are 0, so the answer here is just 12. And then a of 3, which is the upper bound of the boundary, uh, interval that we're considering the acceleration values for uh, 3 times 3 square minus 6 times 3 plus 12 uh, 3 squared is 9 times 3 is 27 minus 18 plus 12 um, if you work out the arithmetic you end up with uh, 21 and then the critical value here or the extreme value uh, we have 1, so a of 1, let's see, plug that in, 3 times 1 squared minus 6 times 1 plus 12. So 1 squared is 3, I mean 1 squared is 1 times 3 is 3 minus 6 plus 12. Minus 6 plus 12 is positive 6 plus 3 is 9. So which of this is the highest acceleration value? Uh, we can clearly see that the highest acceleration value is 21. So our answer is option letter D, okay? All right, let's take a look at question number uh, 25. It says, what is the area of the region between the graphs of y, y equals x squared and y equals negative x from zero to, from x equals zero to x equals two? So let's uh, make a sketch of the of the situation. These are easy graphs to generate, um, and then we can be able to set up our integrals, limits of integration, and the functions that we're finding this the distance between, and then uh, set up the integral and compute what the value is. Okay. All right. So we're going from zero to two. We have a quadratic function and a negative linear function. So the quadratic function uh, from zero to two looks something like this. Going up. Uh, just a sketch, and then the uh, negative linear function y equals negative x basically goes down like that, something like that, okay? So let's say that this is the value 2 right here, this is 2. So uh, we're basically um, integrating from 0 to 2, uh, finding the area between these two curves from 0 to 2, okay? So we can see that um, we're going to be taking vertical slices, which means that our limits of integration will be along the uh, x-axis. We're going to be integrating from 0 to 2 the difference between f and g. Okay. So the function at the top, we're going to call it f of x. 
okay f of x in this case is a quadratic function x squared and the function at the bottom uh, this is a negative linear function let's call it g of x which is negative x okay so the uh, area in between these two curves this region let me shade it uh, this is what we're looking for here the area in between this curve um, is simply going to be given by the expression the integral from 0 to 2 of um, f of x minus g of x dx okay that is basically the expression for the, uh, the uh, area between these two curves all right so let's go ahead and apply the two functions that we have. So we're integrating from 0 to 2. f of x is x squared minus, we have to be careful with the sign here. There's a minus there already. So it's minus negative x, OK? And then dx. OK, so let's simplify this and then find the antiderivative. So we're integrating from 0 to 2 of x squared plus x. Um, dx. Now, if we apply the power rule for integrals, we're going to have x to the third over 3 plus x squared over 2, evaluated from 0 to 2. And then applying FTC part 2, we're going to plug in the upper limits 2 to the third over 3 plus 2 squared over 2. When plugging the lower limits, which is 0, it's just going to be zeros. Okay, so minus 0 plus 0, so just drop that. 2 to the third is 8 over 3 plus um plus uh wait a minute what did I just do here plus two square over two two goes here one and then that's just a one right there it's four over two which is just two plus two over one find the L C D times it by three top and bottom so it's simply going to be eight plus six which is fourteen over three uh if it's 3, 6, which is 4 over 3. I don't know why I wrote 16. It's supposed to be 14. So it's going to be 14 over 3. And there goes the answer, option letter D. Okay? So there, there you have it.